Yeah. Uh, so I want to ask who I'm talking to. I mean, data science, nobody knows what it means. And people who come to a data science conference, nobody knows who they could be. So first, let me ask a few questions. Uh, is there a marker? Oh, yeah, there is. I see it. So first of all, who, uh, who here is already somewhat of a data scientist and who is not? So first question, who is? Okay, so a lot. Uh, so we have data scientists here. That probably means we have a little bit more geeky talk coming up. Uh, who here uh, already works with very large amounts of data or who here would like to work with large amounts of data? Who, who has? Uh, why? Okay, so uh, introductory talk, maybe not so much. So now we have a question of preference. Uh, uh, if I were to give you a preference of mathematics or writing a program, so designing the mathematics, writing the program, <coughs> so who would prefer the mathematics? And who would prefer the computer program? A little bit on the programming side. And I have to say, that's where I am, too. I'm totally confused. Uh, I love mathematics. I love programming uh, and the other. So uh, next question is, uh, who prefers philosophy and architecture to delivering something that's concrete? So philosophy first, and then the delivery, the solid thing. OK. So these are delivery types. <laughs> so it's kind of like the, the people who deliver the concrete <laughs> and the Tonga shift. Uh, can you make that joke in German? <laughs> OK, so um, then what I'm going to talk about, is I, I was worried that this would be too much, to, that I would need to give a very introductory lecture. But uh, it sounds like uh, it's, it's good, uh, in spite of this question, I'm going to talk a little bit about why, uh, why things have changed, why there's such a dramatic change recently. And there's this huge mystery. Can I just? OK. There's this huge mystery that we have in the world right now. And that's related to why everybody thinks it's so exciting to do big data. Why is it just right now? Why has this been this revolution? So uh, first theory is, ah, uh, there's a threshold. Thank you. So the, the, the first theory is that there's a threshold of value or of size or something like that. So once you have the big data, then it becomes obvious that you want to use it. <coughs> and there's another theory that says, oh no, it's, it's the value per byte that makes the difference. And people with extreme value that they can extract from the data, they would be the first to use it. And uh, so there's many of these theories. So let's, let's talk about some of them. And I think they're all wrong. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll go into that. No Wi-Fi, just show me the slides. Yeah, this is it. Voila. So um, these things are exploding. They're just everybody's doing it. suddenly, very suddenly. Companies are being funded. Our company got funded based on this. See, now far, I even got a hat. Uh, books are being written. We wrote a book. Uh, Applications, people are writing applications. And uh, here's a more interesting, more objective thing. Over the last four or five years, this is the number of searches for Hadoop becoming very popular, 10x growth. Here's the number of jobs having to do with Hadoop 
explosion, right? This is only over three years, and yet it's gone from zero to a very high level. Uh, and where I live, this is becoming a requirement for getting a software engineering job in certain areas. Uh, but this, this explosion is a mystery, as I said. Moore's law, the, the thing that says the cost performance of computers doubles every three years or 18 months, depending on which kind of hardware, it has applied now for 50 years. So we have seen six, 18, uh, 16 doublings in, in, in that time. It's a huge thing. But Hadoop and related techniques are exploding right now. Why not 10 years ago? Why not 20 years ago? If it were just size, if it were just the people who had big data, then the existing companies that have the most data would do it first. They didn't. So that's not it. If it were just the, the net positive value for getting then it would be finance companies. It wasn't. If, you know, almost any of these threshold arguments would say startups would not be the place that did it absolutely the first, but they were. And it's, it's happening across all industries, across all scales, across all kinds of companies, old and new. So that's the mystery. Why is it all at once? And when you ask that question, most people will give you a graph like this. They say storage levels are going up, and costs are going down, and they cross right there. And look, that's next year. They go, <laughs> they go red and blue. You know, that must be that must be big. And in, in the United States we have a technical term for this kind of graph. It's called bullshit. <laughs> this is the way we spell it, because otherwise people would know what we're saying. But, uh, you know, it's a confusing language. It's difficult to spell it. It's pronounced bullshit. <laughs> uh, and the reason it is, because there's two axes here. And so I could scale either one of these, and I could make these lines cross any time from 1970 to 2100. So, you know, there's nothing special with this graph about now. But something is clearly very special about now. Something is, you know, out, out of the ordinary. The, the, if you look at relational databases, it took 30 years for them to take over. And even now, there's revolution against that. And yet, these techniques are jumping out everywhere. And people are adopting it across great amounts of things. And I think that it comes down to this question here, is how does it scale? And excuse me, I changed the slide. Just imagine that that thing moved up. I changed the template and, and everything's a different place. Imagine that that's there. And it's a matter of big data does linear scaling, and old school data does exponential or quadratic scaling. I'll draw a picture. So we have value increasing, and value comes in small numbers, of course. It's always hard to get. And we have scale. Scale's big, so it comes in big numbers. And any time we, we make things bigger, it gets valuable first. But as the scale increases, it gets harder and harder and harder to pull out value. If you work with data, you've seen this, right? You obviously look at the most valuable bytes first, and the ones you think are least valuable later. Right? Please nod your heads. I mean, anything you do, the, the easy thing comes first. Because you always do the easy thing first. And so you get what's called diminishing returns. And in data analysis, it's a very sharp corner, usually. It isn't just kind of slowly getting steeper. It gets easy very quickly, and you get a lot of value very quickly, and then it gets hard. Hard to get more value. But the cost does this. It, it's pretty flat here, but then it gets steeper and steeper. And, you know, eventually there are some things that are worth doing. You know, like we'd rather not have uh, nuclear bombs in the corner store, that sort of thing. So preventing that sort of thing, we can apply a huge amount of data analytics. Uh, but other levels, we may just want to go, oh, yeah, that's enough. Like, is it time to cross the street? But in general, the more data you try to pull out, the harder and harder it gets. And with old style techniques, even if one machine is this big, 
uh, going to two machines used to be hard, but if one machine is tiny, the cost of parallelism with old school techniques got harder and harder and harder as the if scale got bigger. So the, the difficulty goes up and the value flattens out. This is just universal in traditional techniques. And so the net value does this. And if the co cost is steepening and the value is flattening, then there's almost no way for us to ever escape beyond that corner. And so computer science up to now has been climbing this. And lately, for the last 20 years or more, we've been trapped just before that corner. And you can go up a little bit, but you know, dramatic changes in this curve, it's still going to be steeper than the flat part of that thing very quickly. And so we will be trapped by that corner. But the big data techniques that we talk about now have linear scaling. They, they, you accept restrictions on what you can do, things like NoSQL movements, things like MapReduce, Hadoop, and things like that. You accept restrictions on how you can program, how you, which problems you can solve. And in return, you get this very linear scaling curve. The costs scale linearly. And as we develop these techniques, <coughs> the scale is going down. And that's the same kind of change that's been occurring for the traditional costs. But because these are linear, we have a dramatic change. Here's how the net value curve scales. And you can see that it suddenly becomes very nearly flat. And if you could imagine a bubble under each of these curves, right as that becomes flat, very nearly flat, as the cost curve becomes down to the slope of that upper curve, the bubble will slide very far out. And so suddenly, the optimal scale changes by three orders of magnitude, or four, or five. The optimal scale of data for working with, for whatever reason that you're doing, as long as your costs, your human, your hardware, your software costs are linear, suddenly it's worthwhile to look at a thousand times more data. And so to reach there, we have to do horizontal, linear scaling. It has to be totally easy to just add more computers. It has to be very easy. There's no hidden gotchas in the data or the data techniques. So we cannot have references between tables because that causes disks to have to seek and suddenly the costs go up. We can no longer structure our data well. Maybe we can do it at the beginning but our minds will change in six months, and we will need a different structure. And to go back and fix the old data costs more and more, and has a risk of error. And so that results in a quadratic cost. So we have to leave the old data as it was. Therefore, we store everything as it was. And we record how we interpreted it once upon a time, but we don't go back and change the data. We can change how we interpreted it later but we cannot afford the quality assurance test to make sure it's right. So we have these flexible data dictionaries. And we also begin to look at disorganized data. It still has structure, it still has content, but things like the web are not like a database anymore. I, if, if, is there a database person here? Uh, somebody who's an expert with databases? Okay, yeah, good. That's, that's always good because I love to make jokes about databases. <laughs> it's always nice to have somebody in the room that I can offend. Uh, so, you know, the, the database person normally, you don't have microphones, so I'll just say what you would say. Uh, would, would say that, but these things are horrible, you should structure the data, because then you get benefits and efficiencies and things like that. You should, you should define that, and you should well structure it, and you should stamp out errors in that. And, I, you know, I'm always happy to meet a person like this, because there's this thing called the web, and it's just a mess. And these links that don't go anywhere and everything. Please, could you go fix that for me? And it's not funny. I mean, uh, people try. This whole semantic web thing is people going to try to fix the web. And the web just makes mess bigger than any, faster than anybody can fix it. And so we have to use these very flexible techniques because 
the, the mess is growing faster than we can fix it. The size of data that we can make beautiful is limited in size. And it can't get much bigger because <coughs> we're limited in size. Our brains are limited. So we can talk a little bit more. Uh, but that's the big, big, big thing, is that that linear scaling and the techniques that lead to linear scaling, and I can talk more about exactly what those are, are, are really critical to data science at this time. This is a revolutionary moment. Things are changing. We're turning that corner. And the scale of data that people are talking about doing routinely, and, and the, that everybody in this room does, every time you do a web search, you are using big data for your own purposes. And it's an inner, you know, interwoven society where people will do something with data and then somebody else will do something, somebody else will consume it. And, and so, you know, we're all doing this big data thing already. And we find a little bit more value. Is, is Google better than a phone book? It's not really different, is it? You're just looking up information. Well, the, the fact that everybody's adding that information because everybody is seeing these changing benefits is changing the style of that. And now there's another thing happening. The, the physics of how a startup and a big company works are different. In a, in a startup, when you get to here, you think you're really big because you're three times bigger than you were 10 units of time ago. Well, then when you get here, you say the same thing. We're three times bigger than we were 10 units ago. Well, forget about that. We were wrong then. And then you get further here, and you say, ah, we're three times bigger than we were 10 units ago. Never mind what we said before. It's this exponential growth that's the characteristic of a, well, of a successful startup. An unsuccessful startup gets to here and just kind of goes like this until somebody decides to quit. But this is how a, a, a successful startup works. In the past, it never matters. And the size varies, the, the scale varies. And one company I had, our traffic doubled every week, which is a nightmare, because it took three weeks to order computers and one week to install them, which is 16 times bigger. So I always had to have on order 16 times as many computers as we had. It was, it was a nightmare. Yeah. Happily, it only lasted six weeks, and then it moderated to every two months, and that's doable. I just talked to another company. Their traffic doubles every month, and so they're in this exponential phase. And in this phase, if you ask the person here, is it okay if I delete the, the logs from here? They go, you know, I want to save space. I'm going to delete the old logs. They say, how big are they? And you say, oh, they're 1% they're of our total storage. And they say, oh, don't, don't worry about that. that. That doesn't matter at all. Or I say, should we convert them to the new format? I have, he says, how big are they? I say, 1%. He says, I don't care. It just doesn't matter. So the, the rule is that the past really doesn't matter. And the future is all that matters to a startup. The future is everything. Because we have everything to win and nothing to lose. The future is going to be much bigger, or we will have another job. It's just a definition. And so that's the way startups are. They don't look back, and they don't care about compatibility with the past. But after this, this is the startup again on a new scale. And as we see as before, what we thought was big before is now small. The company is now successful, and the absolute growth rate is bigger than it ever was here but the relative growth rate is quite small. And that means that the past is now big, whereas before it was small. And so with a big, large company that exists and is, is successful, uh, the past is important, and we have to we accumulate this state, and it's always big compared to the future. And so we have to integrate, and we have to be cautious, because the past is bigger than the future that the value that we have now is bigger than the value we'll add in a short time. And so compatibility is crucial. There's a picture here. This is the way a startup works. We, we find a computer on the street, you know, West Move, that sort of thing. It happens. Uh, startups throw away their computers because they have big new ones. And then it gets bigger, and, and it's exciting. And then it gets crazy. And in the end, the, the old little computer here, 
we put it on the street for the next startup. So it just doesn't matter. Do we care about compatibility? No. But the big enterprise starts with a huge thing, and we start with a <coughs> big, big data. This is big data here, supposedly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more efficient than the old little data, so it needs less hardware, actually. And of course, it's just a test, so it's very small. And even when we make it big, unless it's a company like Google, the, the, the Hadoop cluster or whatever big data thing will be relatively small compared to what the business is already. And can we ignore the old stuff? No. We don't put it on the curve. We have to work together. And so this is what's coming up. That's what's happening. That's why it's happening. And that's, that's where it goes from here. And so then the question is, how do we deal with this? What do we do? as data scientists, how can we make this, this change so that we don't get trapped behind the corner? I, I met a guy, this is a, a diversion, I met a guy in 2003. Uh, I had a, an intern coming from Germany and we we're trying to find him a, a flat to live in. And we found this guy who had a room to rent. This looked like a good idea. He was a computer programmer. This was 2003. He was a COBOL programmer. <laughs> now this, you know, you walk along the beach and you find a very rare shell, you know, because it's an extinct, and you get very excited, right? Well, this is this is kind of like that. We found, I thought they were extinct, and and uh, it was not surprising to me. This this person did not seem aware of things that were happening in the world. That's probably why he was still a COBOL programmer. <laughs> um, and he said, you know. Business was really good in 1999, and it wasn't bad in the year 2000, but it's really kind of dried up since then. I don't get it. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the guy who put the 2000 Y2K bug in in the first place. He didn't get it then, and then they hire him to fix it, and then they stop hiring him to fix it because it's afterwards it either matters or it's broken. It doesn't matter anymore. And he doesn't understand yet. It was very interesting. So we need to not become the COBOL programmers of the future who are trapped behind that corner. We need to be the, the, the new people who are released into the, into the wild. So the way we have to do this is what I call scale-free computing. <coughs> the idea there is that the programmer, somebody like me, has no idea in their head how big the data will be or how big the computer will be. Only if I do not know will I avoid putting assumptions in my program. If I do know, if you tell me a billion bytes or a tr trillion bytes, if you tell me one computer, you tell me a hundred or a thousand, if you tell me how many computers or how big the data is, I will put that assumption in there somehow by accident or on purpose. And so we must not know. And so we must have styles of computing that allow us to not know. Normal computing, we cannot do without that knowledge. Even with parallel programming in the old school with MPI, you have to know how large the cluster is, and it has to relate to how large the data is. And so we have several styles. MapReduce allows scale-free computing of a certain batch orientation. BSB, there's an Apache program called Giraffe, which is spelled with a strange way. It's PH at the end instead of FF. And that provides a more iterative style of scale-free computing. And there's a general class called Actors. There's a system, an open source system called Storm. It provides scale-free computing in real time with all the data flows. It doesn't stop. These are techniques that we need to use. But the data itself, we also need to talk about denormalization. Does denormalization mean anything? Does, who, who has a meaning for that word? Yeah, so we, we should talk about that. So denormalization, and let's talk about normalization first, uh, the, the, the idea that Cod had a long time ago. The idea was that you would, should not repeat data in a database. If you have an address of a person, you should have the address in an address table, and you should refer to that address. So if they change their address, Every place that refers to that will be up to date. It's not a bad idea. But what it means is that always you find a reference, and you have to go look somewhere else for the data. This happens all over the place. So, you know, 
if, if I work in a place that has five employees and I have two addresses, uh, there will be a table for, uh, for business, there will be a table for employees, there will be a table for addresses, there will be a table for people, you know, and you have links all over the place. You might have a thousand tables and, and hundreds to thousands of links. And we have to stop doing that. And it's a very simple reason. If you take a very simple example, say we have uh, a terabyte database, not very big, and it has 100 byte records in it. And I want to update 1% of these records. Sounds easy, you just go through and update 1% of them. But the naive method requires one seek, move the head on the disk, one rotation to read the data, and one rotation to write the data. And so that's about 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, to do the read, modify, write for each record. And there's 10 to the 10th of those, I believe, something like that. The result is it takes 3 million seconds, about 30 days, to do this task. But if we do a different thing, if we just read, say, 5 gigabytes at a time of the database, read it all in, make the changes in memory, and write it all back, and read the next chunk, and write it all back. It takes six hours. So if we do 100 times more work, we read 100 times more data, and we write 100 times more data, if we do 100x more work, it takes 100x less time. This is insane, right? This is not normal world where doing it 100 times stupider makes it 100 times faster. But the idea is that we have a smooth access. We read in a very smooth and ordered way. And on a computer, disordered access is becoming very expensive at all levels. And so we need to make everything embedded in line so we can read it smoothly. We also have inertia. We have all these physics analogies now, big data, is big, it's heavy, and it's hard to move. It takes time to move it, and once it's moving, we can't turn it very easily. And so we have to move computation to the data. No longer do we have disk over here, storage over there, and compute over here. They have to mix, because we can't move the data, and we can move the computation. So all of these techniques work this way, all of the MapReduce, the ESP models, and the actors models all define conventional relational models talk about a database over there and computers over here. And those are all not okay. And we can't just use one model. We can't just use relational. We can't just use MapReduce. We have to be flexible in all these ways. So uh, I think now we should talk about what you guys are doing. And, and see what applies directly. So let's just nominate a few people and, and let's ask what problems there are that you face. We'll start with you. Me? Yeah, you. She says you're the wrong person. Yeah, because um, I'm just going to come on and work What kind of design? Um, Interface design, so I'm trying to do it. Uh, this matters a lot to you. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the reason it matters is because one of the most important things about designing, just talking to people, basically, I mean, that, that's a very people thing that you do. The most important thing about that is the freedom to be wrong. You know that a very, very good person will be wrong most of the time about what's a good design. They will make this amazing. Users are amazing. They discover things that we never thought of. And so if you have to be correct, you'll be very careful, right? If I tell you, if I make a mistake, I hit you on the head, you'll be very careful and you'll leave. That's what you'll do. But then you have to be very careful. <laughs> and very cautious, and you need to look very carefully at everything you do. But if I say, oh, it's fine, it's fine, you could be wrong 90% of the time. I just want a lot of ideas. You'll give me a lot of ideas. Now, the result is, if she gives me 100 times more ideas, and she's wrong 90% of the time, then she gives me 10 times more right ideas than before. 
And so the question is, how can we let her be wrong 90% of the time and be right 10 times more? And that's big data. That's, that's A-B testing and all of the different variants of that multivariate testing, where we should give that to you, where you can make that live just on a whim. Maybe I try this this morning. Just try it. And if you could just try things, it's so much easier, isn't it? It's just like a load off. And you can just basically ask all the users out there what the right answer is, what works for them. So you have big data. You, you need big data anyway. So this is the right place. Yeah, it's, it's a welcoming place. OK, you. I'm a classmate of first. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy answer. Well, do you accept the answers that I gave her? OK, well, then we move on. These people look so surprised when I do this. Even the third <laughs> time, they go, how did this happen? Well, I don't work with big data. Uh, I'm a scientific manager of many institutions in Potsdam, and I work with people that have big data and trying to organize them and use them most of the time. So you, you care a lot about the philosophy and what will make them successful and in what ways they can go crazy and not make things successful. By the way, people talk a lot about big data as if it's something that a person will consume. That there will be a dashboard. You know, that's a common use, and, and uh, Foss was talking about that. There, he's not over there. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but very often, it isn't like that. Big data often has a big consumption, not a small consumption. The big consumption means that a million people consume the data instead of one person to make a decision. A good example, and, and it's very deceptive too. Like if we go to Google and we do a search, it feels like it's one person talking to one computer, right? It feels like that. But in fact, there are hundreds of millions of people talking to millions of computers. It's not at all like that. And so the big data, you know, if big data came from somewhere, you know, if we're consuming it, it's coming out of the system, it had to go into the system in the same volume. We'll go in, it has to equal go out. It can't come from nothing. And so the, the fact is that it's the mass of people talking to this thing that makes it a big data system. And you say, well, but it's just searching the web. But the web is people. It's, it's the artifact of people. It's things people made, their fingertips. And so to, to the, the big data is big people as well. And so that's really what science is all about, is, is how to make big masses of knowledge consumable by all of society. It's, it's the same problem. You have a hand up. This is amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm very sorry. I uh, just, just wondered whether you could spend some, some thoughts on, um, on moving the emphasis from structured data to unstructured information. So I've, I've worked or I've worked on both sides, both on structured information, numbers, and so on, um, but also on, on unstructured things like, um, for example, handling large amounts of texts, handling about what people think about these texts, what are they are interested in, and how that fits, for example, in the tool sets you were mentioning. Yeah, happy to. I don't have. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of slides on that topic. But far too many is the problem. We have the problem of big data here. Uh, and so I don't, I'm not going to uh, use slides there. But the basic idea is that relational databases would have a constraint, a limitation. They would only let you put a string, a number of different kinds, or a, a true-false thing in a field. And that was it. And they couldn't put a complex thing inside a field. So uh, inside your address, for instance, in a database, they would never put your address. They would put a link to another table that would have many rows in it. And they couldn't really put, they could put text in there, but they couldn't interpret it as text. And they always had these references. And so it was a very indirect sort of approach. And so the, the correct approach for big data, though, is to embed it in line. So if we have a, a person's description, and then we would have a list of addresses, a list of automobiles and bicycles that they have, 
and a list of the times that they have talked to us. And inside each time that they talked to us, it would have a list of the words they said. Maybe, maybe they called on the telephone and, and we had a computer listen and, and the, the words that it thought they, they said. Or they sent an email and inside that then is a list of the words inside the email in each one of those. So that's one big user object. So that becomes what people call unstructured, but this is almost backwards. It's, it's really more structured, there's more intricate structure than there is in the old database style. And so that's what the unstructured data is. And so we need mathematics and techniques to deal with that. And the mathematics have to be different a little bit. These, these now come from, they need to be statistical typically because they, when you have text or when you have user actions, you can't know enough to really say exactly what's happening. And I, I use an example uh, of a coin. This, this talks about knowledge. And what, how do we talk about knowledge? So if I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to ask you, what was the probability of heads or tails? 0.5. 0 0.5. Why do you say that? Is it, is it really exactly 0.5, or could it be 1? You don't know this point. You don't know me. That's the same side, it would be 1. Or if it's the other same side, it could be 0, right? Or I could cheat, and it could be 0.25, right? So really, when you say 0.5, you're saying, well, it could be anything, right? And that's just kind of a middle thing. So I'll make the smallest error if I say the middle, right? Now, if I flip the coin, I already flipped it. It's not the future. It's not the past. What's the probability of hits? Zero, one. But the hit is heads or, or tails, right? But what's the probability of hits? For you? It's the point five. Yeah. So, so the most important thing you said is for me, right? It's a matter of perspective. If I look at this and I now know if it's heads or tails, what do you say? <laughs> Doesn't help me. Doesn't help you. Will I say the same thing? No. If I'm not an idiot, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's heads. So, so probability is knowledge or lack of knowledge, right? And, and the first probability that you had when you said 0.5, and it really could have been almost anything, it could have been 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, or 0, right? They're just expressing a way of saying unknown, right? Now we have the problem of black swans as well, things that are totally unexpected. So you said 0.5 chance for heads, 0.5 chance for tails. There's nothing left, right? Nothing left for the black swan. So we always need to leave a little bit in there. So probability is the language we need to talk about for things, even though they have a, an absolute physics, right? They have an answer but we don't know it. Probability is the language we need to use. And so probability is how we need to describe text or other things. And then the key data type there is a sequence of symbols. And maybe the symbols have a time attached to each one, and maybe they have a value attached to each one. If they have a time and a value, then the symbol with its attachments become a transaction. If they just have time, it might be an utterance, a, a decoded speech thing, or an observation of which train came by, things like that. But that's the data type we need to work with. And that's where textual things come in. Those are sequences of symbols. That's where the web comes in. There's sequences of symbols, and there are sequences of links. And the links are themselves symbols. And that's how log files work. Those are symbols, things people did, and who they were with times. So that's really where we need to go, and that's really the mathematics that we need to analyze that. And I'm not going to start writing sigmas up there right now because we have very little time. In fact, how much time do we have yet? Okay. It's open. Okay. So, to say, so if you need another five or ten minutes, that's of course yeah. fine. Well, then we're not going to answer that question. So, okay, yeah. that's fine. so you, with the 50% the, the very cleverly said, and the for you. What do you do with data? 
Um, I work at EdCount, and uh, um, my main purpose of work is to optimize the selection process online and image text uh, ads. Ah. And uh, long, on the long run, to collect more and more user data and uh, optimize it from this perspective. So, wait, 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 wait. what exactly do you do with that? That's what the, the, the big goal is. <clears throat> yeah. What do you do? What do I do? Right now, it's um, doing operation research thanks to uh, mathematics. Mathematics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, oh me, yeah. I'm doing. I'm from. I come from the statistics statistics corner. So. Okay. A friend in, in the wilderness here. And I have to learn more about the IT corner. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> we have five minutes. Klaus says. Uh, what should we do from here? Uh, should we talk a little bit about techniques? Should we talk about examples of history? Uh, what's the most... I've got a question. Oh, there you go. And maybe there are others. <coughs> yeah. So uh, the question I have is, um, so what what do we need to uh, learn? Well, what kind of mindset do we need to, to, to uh, take hold of all these changing in, in IT and uh, de-normalizing things and statistical new algorithms? We need to learn the advanced mathematics of counting. That's a really <laughs> difficult thing to do, actually. And uh, surprisingly, the mathematics becomes simpler and simpler and simpler the bigger the data becomes. So counting is the key thing. And actually counting, doing the counting, is quite difficult because you need to count in certain contexts, you need to count very quickly, you need to count very large things, you need to count things that are uncertain. That's the first thing. The second thing is we need to, to learn a, an attitude of just try it. Find data and try something. Find some web data and find links. Just start doing it. These are the things that become very easy with practice and seem totally impossible without the practice, without the experience. And these are now things that are quite available. And so those are the two things that I think are necessary. First, learn all the methods for counting. Second, to learn the methods for dealing with big data. Very often uh, in a job interview in these sorts of areas, somebody asks, what sort of data have you dealt with? And if you haven't dealt with anything big and seen the friction and the mess that happens, they just say, well, thank you. And then they don't hire. And relating to my talk and to the <coughs> business side of these issues and new world, so yeah. to say, so. What are the two or three things that business managers need to get to understand that there's new things happening and they change things dramatically, maybe? So what do they under, do they need to understand? So just, I need to understand that this is difficult or not? Or yeah. So business people are basically units for making decisions. And they need to make decisions from data. <laughs> no, that's what I use them for. So that must be the truth. Uh, the, uh, the idea is that they can make decisions in different ways. Some people make decisions from an anecdote, from one example. They will draw a whole universe of conclusions. And this is a useful philosophical style. But in the modern big data world, the right way to do it is to draw it from many examples. And so to be able to pull together a lot of data and make a data-driven decision is the key key skill. Keeps jumping, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> How extraordinary. Uh, I thought nothing was happening over here. Uh, but anyway, so the, this ability to use data, to, to look at it intelligently, is the key management skill. But the other key management skill, which is far more difficult for these people, because they are just like the Google searchers who think of themselves as the user and the other thing as the system. Business people tend to think of data as focusing on them. They need it minimized down to something that they can read and understand and make a decision. It's their purpose in life, after all. Uh, they think so, too. and. Uh, that's wrong. In the new world, very often the data itself must decide on its own. The systems must decide on their own. They must work with people directly and automatically. And uh, it, there's no time for a human to make the decision. 
And there's too many decisions to make. If you have a trillion decisions to make, you can you have two choices. You can start at the top and make some blanket decision and be wrong half the time. So you make half a trillion mistakes. Or you can start and make every decision one at a time, and you can make you know hundreds or thousands of decisions correctly, and you never make almost a trillion decisions. So you have to automate that somehow. And you have to have a mass of people to talk to your system. And you have to appear intelligent to every one of them. It's no longer artificial intelligence then. It's reflected intelligence. If he's a clever guy and he does something extraordinary, and I just say the same thing to this guy, he thinks I'm smart. It's like in the morning, I look at the mirror, it appears to be an intelligent thing, it waves back at me. And the mirror itself is not very smart. Obviously, the man in the mirror is very clever. But uh, the same thing is what we need to build mirrors as businesses that reflect the intelligence of our users, the cleverness of our users back at each other. And these are recommendation systems, these are automatic pricing systems, these are automated design selection systems. We can put the creativity and the spark in it, but then the, that spark must catch fire on its own. We can't keep blowing on it. So that's the key skill for managers, is to let go and build that into an automated <coughs> system. Okay. So. Any other questions? Anybody else want to tell us what they do with data? No. Maybe know. not now, yeah. maybe later. And I'll be here quite almost the whole day, uh, so uh, we can talk. That's fine. Yeah. So cool. Um, thank you, Ted. Uh, you lost five. five.